Well, hey, good morning again, church. Uh, as you can see, I had a quick uh, wardrobe change and had a quick haircut as well between that last shot and now. But so excited to be here this morning and to continue our journey through the book of Ezra. And today we're in chapter two, which to be honest with you, when we first laid out this series, seemed like a really ominous chapter to be preaching on because it is a chapter made up entirely of a list of names. So 125 names in this list. So I'm not even going to read the passage this morning. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce some of these names. They're, they're really difficult. And perhaps as you look at this chapter, you wonder, well, maybe all that it could be good for is if you're about to have a child, you're thinking of some unique names. For your children, then maybe you could look at this list and and find some unique sounding names. So let me let me help you with that. So, uh, for example, we've got a name in that list, Big Vi, which means happy. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's another name there, Aden, not to be confused with Aden. So Aden, which means voluptuous. So probably be careful with that one. There's another name, uh, Jorah. This one's so amazing. Jorah, like Dora, but with a J. Jorah means autumn rain. How cool is that? And then there's this name, Barzillai. So if you are about to have a son, you would want to seriously consider the name Barzillai because it means, get this, literally, Iron Man. That's right. And in fact, there is such a cool story uh, behind the name Barzillai that I'd love to get into. We don't have time for that this morning. Uh, in fact, there's actually lots of great stories behind, behind these names and a great story behind this list of names. There is a very real reason that we have this list of names in our scriptures. Uh, and if we've ever wondered about, well, maybe it was just some overzealous accountant who wanted to record things. No, this exact list is repeated in Nehemiah chapter 7. Right? So there's something that we've got to learn from this chapter this morning. And I want to pull out three lessons from this list of names of Ezra chapter 2. And these, these lessons will come from first just standing back and looking at the big picture as to why we have this incredibly detailed genealogy in the Bible, this list. And then we're going to zoom in a little bit, and then we're going to zoom in even further. So let's start by just stepping back and looking at why we have this list. So one of the best questions that you can ask when reading the Bible and trying to study the Bible and hear for God in the Bible, one of the best questions you can ask is, what does this teach me about God? So what does this list of names teach me about God? Well, what it teaches is something we learned last week, that God is faithful, that He fulfills His promises. Here we have an accurate record in immense detail of God's promise to preserve His people and lead them back to the place from which He sent them into exile in very much detail. And here's why the detail is important. So this is just really a little thing, but it's something that I'm always concerned about. You may know as a Christian, this morning, I hope you know that well, God loves everybody. And then you think to yourself, well, I'm part of everybody, so therefore God loves me, which is fine, but that's not actually how this works. The love that God has for you is not a logical, deductive step. You know, for God so loved the world and I'm in the world, so therefore God, God loves me. The love that God has for you is direct. This is a list of names of people recorded forever as a list of these are people that God fulfilled his promises to. He's not just fulfilling his promises to his people that we looked at last week and we're thinking, well, I'm part of his people. So he fulfills his promises to me. No, this is a list of God fulfilling his promises to individuals with names and families. 
Let me give you just one little bit of detail uh, from this list. A quick example of what this list shows us is how personal God is, how personally He interacts with each one of us. So one of the names on this list from verse 23, uh, it's, the, it's the place Anathoth. Have you heard of the place Anathoth? Neither had I. And it just simply says there, the men of Anathoth, 128. And we're thinking... Okay, well, in Jeremiah chapter 32, and remember, Jeremiah is the prophet prophesying at this same time period. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, so as the Babylonians, they've besieged the city of Jerusalem. So they camped outside the walls. It's like this months long siege. They're about to breach the walls. They're about to storm in, destroy the city. Everyone's about to be made exiles. And God says to Jeremiah, as the Babylonians are outside about to bust in, God says, Jeremiah, I want you to go and buy the field at Anathoth. And now you're thinking, man, that's got to be, what is God doing to Jeremiah? That's the worst investment advice ever. Because these guys are about to break in and destroy everything. And now God's telling Jeremiah, go buy that field at Anathoth. Why? That God asked Jeremiah to do that. And we read in verse 15 of Jeremiah 32, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. You see, there's this promise. Everyone's so afraid. They know what's about to happen. The disaster is impending. They're going to lose everything. And God says, Jeremiah, go buy that field, take that title deed and bury it, because I'm telling you, you will come back and this place, this field will be yours again. And so as God stirs the heart of Cyrus and these people get to go back home, we read that 128 men of Anathoth went back home. No doubt knowing that, that trying to dig up this title deed, this, this time capsule signifying God's promises, not just to Israel, God's promises to the family of Anathoth. And so as we move from last week to this, yeah, God is faithful to preserve us and to fulfill his providence. But it's not just a big us, it's you. Where you're sitting on your couch or in bed or outside in the garden in the lovely sunshine, you, he's buried time capsules in the future, this preservation of his personal promises to you. So that's one reason why we have a very detailed list is because it shows us God is personal in how he interacts with us. The second lesson that we learn from this list comes from when we zoom in a little bit more and see what this list is exactly a list of. So it's a list of names, names of people that God called to go back from Babylon to return to Jerusalem to rebuild by rebuilding the temple. It's a list of names God called to go back and a list of names of people who responded to God's call. So in, in going back to last week, chapter 1, probably the most important verse there uh, was verse 5, which says, Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites. Listen to this. Everyone whose spirit... God stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. This list is a record of those whose spirit God stirred to go back and who responded to that call. And we know how many it was. 42,360 of them responded and went back home, which is not very many. Most of the Jews living in Babylon, given the opportunity to go back home, stayed. 
And you might think, well, that's crazy. You've been given the opportunity to go back to your homeland. Why, why wouldn't you take it? But remember, the entire place has been destroyed and they were living pretty comfortable lives in Babylon. Now, we know that because there's a list of everything that the people uh, around those who returned gave to support their work in going home and rebuilding the temple. And it's a huge amount of wealth. Now, we might be tempted to criticize those who stayed behind, but remember again, Jeremiah writes this letter now to the Jews living in exile in Babylon. And, and in chapter 29, for me, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, that's so much to say about what we do as a church. But Jeremiah 29 verse 7, Jeremiah writes to the people in exile. He says, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile, says the Lord, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare, which is a strong message of, hey, you're going to Babylon, but I want you to thrive and flourish there. Seek the welfare of the city and you'll find your welfare. And they did that and they found incredible welfare. And then they gave these contributions to the people who were going back home to rebuild the temple. And that was their, the part that they played in this incredible phase in history. So we don't criticize those who stayed. But then again, there is also no list of courageous names of people who stayed. What we have in chapter 2 is a list of names of courageous people who left what was comfortable who responded to that stirring of God on their hearts and who, and who went. And it is, make no mistake, this is an honor roll of courageous people. They journeyed on foot a distance of literally Joburg to Cape Town. So this is a journey, four months on foot, to go to a place that has been annihilated and has been picked apart by a poverty-stricken remnant to go back and rebuild. And as we'll learn through the rest of Ezra, this rebuilding process, there was a ton of opposition and frustration. This was not the easy option to go back. The easy option was to stay. And yet this small component of courageous people I mean, a group no bigger than like the population of Bryanston plus a little bit. This small group of people becomes the foundation for the development of the largest religion in the world, Christianity, and becomes the cornerstone on which the storyline of Jesus is ultimately rebuilt from this group of courageous people who followed the stirring of God on their hearts. And so I want to ask you this, just rather bluntly this morning. What is God stirring on your heart to do to serve his kingdom at this time? See, I, I believe that God is stirring everybody's hearts right now, all of his people around the world. It's a pretty bold statement, but I believe God is stirring the hearts of every one of his followers all over the world to do something. Here's why I think that. I have come to realize that these moments of God stirring in our hearts often, if not always, come as massive disruptions to us in places of great comfort. And what that disruption does is it frees us to be able to follow the voice of God to perhaps some place new, to go somewhere deeper with Him, to do something, yeah, perhaps harder, but that has greater kingdom impact. 
I've just come to see that's often how God works. When He stirs, it's a massive disruption out of our comfort zone, and it leads us to a new place, more difficult, but a place with greater kingdom impact. I mean, I shared with you a little bit just last week of, of my own story in coming here. It was about a year ago that I preached at Rosebank um, just as a guest preacher. And then that, that week, I got a phone call from the, the chairman of the call committee, Dave, who phoned me and asked whether I'd be willing to apply for, for this position. And I remember telling Dave like so many times after that day, just how disruptive that phone call was. I mean, I was just at, at that time in a place, just in, like in a comfort zone. Things were going so well, ministry-wise, family just had really settled. And it's almost like oftentimes I, I honestly wished that I never got that phone call because it was so disruptive. And a key turning point for me, massive turning point in my journey towards investigating this and now being here was realizing that disruption, as difficult as it is, is not a threat, but an invitation. An invitation to perhaps yeah, leave behind some of the familiar and comfortable and to follow God someplace new, yes, someplace harder, but potentially a place of greater kingdom impact and a greater experience of needing to live by faith in our relationship with Him. And if you think about it, stories like this abound in the Bible. There's so many cases of this is how God tends to move us someplace new by creating this disruption. So, I mean, the classic example is Abram, Genesis chapter 12. He's an incredibly wealthy man. He's living in a beautiful part of the world, Haran. And we know that it must have been spectacular there because his father had journeyed. In fact, was, they were on their way to Canaan and they came through Haran and thought, well, this place is amazing. They decided to stay there. So Abram's a wealthy man living in a beautiful part of the world. And God comes to Abram. You know the story and says, I want you to leave your family, your kindred, your community, everything you know, and go to some place I'm going to show you. And we read in the Bible some of the most amazing words, and Abram went. Just stunning that he would do that. God just disrupts this entire place of comfort, and Abram follows him, which is why Abraham then becomes for us a model of a person of faith, starting with the story. And in fact, we think about at the same time period of Ezra, we've got the stories of Esther, the stories of Daniel, both of those stories exactly the same, moments of great interruption and disruption that forces people out of their comfort zones, but into new places, difficult, and God uses them incredibly for His glory. So, so God uses disruption as invitation to shake us out of what has become comfortable and to lead us oftentimes to new places or to a refined sense of knowing what God wants to do in us and through us. Now, I said that I believe God is stirring everybody's hearts around the world, everybody, every, every one of his followers. Why do I say that? Well, because we are currently living... <laughs> through the greatest global disruption of our generation. There's this coronavirus time period and the greatest global disruption of the last 100 years. And I believe that God is using this disruptive event because it is, it, it is changing. It will profoundly change the way we live our lives forever. But God is using this disruptive event in us, perhaps, to do exactly that, to shake us out of our comfort zones, the things we've become comfortable with, to speak to us, to stir in our hearts, to clarify where He wants us and what He wants us to do. And so if we do not come out of lockdown with a clearer sense 
of what God wants to do in us and through us, then we've wasted the invitation that is in this massive disruption. And so I want to ask you again and just ask you a little more personally. How do you think God is using this disruption in your life to clarify his purposes within your family? I think he's doing that in all of us, just helping us refocus on the importance of family. How is he using this disruption in other relationships? How is he using this disruption in your vocation, your career? How is he using this disruption to reshape perhaps your other uh, primary relationships or your, your use of time? It's all changed for us, the use of time. Is it just going to go back to normal when we come out of this? Or is God using this as a bit of a reset on how we use our time and how we use our finances? There's no way in my mind that a disruption of this scale, that God is not going to use that to shape us in particular ways, in narrower ways, give us greater clarity on what he really wants to do with us at this time. So let's not miss it. Amen? Thirdly, so third reason we have this list. So first, it shows us how personal God is. Second, this list shows how God stirs us in moments of disruption to follow him. And the third reason we have this list comes as we zoom in a little bit more into the structure of this list. So he has a quick outline. I'm going to read the whole chapter, but let me give you an outline of how this works. So verse one, it's like the introduction to the list. And it says, now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. That's the introduction. Then verse 2, if you're reading with and you've got your Bibles open, verse 2 is a list of the names of the leaders that went back and led them. And there's 11 names, but if you include in that list of 11, Shesh Bazaar, who's the last person recorded in chapter 1, he was actually the leader of this first wave going back, you have 12 leaders. And 12 is always a significant number in the Bible. You remember the 12 tribes. What's interesting is you'll recall that 10 of the 12 tribes had pretty much been lost. So Judah and Benjamin, but see, God is rebuilding them like he promised to do. So you've got a list of 12 names, their leaders. Then in verse 3 to 20, you have a list of the names of people who returned and they're listed according to their family heritage, which is what you would find in most genealogies in the Bible. A list of names, sons of so-and-so. Then verse 21 to 35 is interesting. It's a list of names of people who returned, but not listed by their family link, listed by their attachment to place. So, for example, the men of Anathoth that we looked at earlier. And there's some places there that we recognize. So as you're reading through, you get to verse 20, verse 21, you you suddenly come across the sons of Bethlehem and you go, well, hang on, that's a place. Yes, it's referring to the place of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And you go down the list then and you see, okay, Bethel, I know Bethel. Again, that's this place where Abraham called out to God and built an altar to him. And later Jacob comes and has that vision of the angels ascending and descending on that stairway, that disruptive moment in Jacob's life. Oh, I know Bethel, I know Jericho. And then a bunch of names of places that we know nothing about. Then if you carry on down the list, verse 36 to 58 is a list of names of people who returned specifically to serve in the temple. So that's the priests, the Levites, other temple servants. It even lists like temple singers, gatekeepers. It's a whole list of people who returned to particularly serve in the temple. And what's interesting is that group makes up about 15% of those returning, which is quite high. 
which you would expect. You're like, yo, they're going to rebuild the temple. So these guys are excited because they get to do their jobs again. I mean, we we know that feeling in returning back from lockdown, except what, what is interesting is that when it comes to the more menial jobs of serving in the temple. So if you read the devotions this past week, Shelley just outlined how some of these guys were like the maintenance crew of the temple and not many of those returned. So in fact, when you get to Ezra 8, there's a lack of Levites. Ezra's like, we need some more Levites. There's not enough, which just goes to show that some of the guys are like, nah, that job's not important enough for me to go back to, which just tells us just once again something we all know. When God does stir to move us into places, it's not always to these great glamorous positions. And then verse 59 to 63 is a list of names of people who couldn't prove their lineage, didn't have the paperwork, which really mainly applied to uh, priests because there needed to be a purity in, in the line of the priests. So that's, that's the structure of this list. Now, there's a couple of really interesting things just about the structure. Uh, just bear with me just for a little bit here. I mean, firstly, it shows us how God intends to structure society. You think about this, you've got a, a list of leaders, so governance, family units, but family units within a wider community, a wider community in particular places, but all centered around worship, which is the second interesting thing about this list, and I wish I could go into a whole sermon on this, but I won't, is just the centrality of worship in this return of people. Uh, maybe we'll save that for another, but I'm sure it's going to come out in this in this series. What's interesting is the difference. If you read Nehemiah 7, where you've got the list, and Ezra, uh, Ezra chapter 2, the list, you'll notice that some of the names are different. And it seems like people have pointed to that and gone, hey, man, that looks like the Bible has errors in it. Uh, which if you want to find out the answer to that question, Ansana and Candace, they nailed it in the kids' stream. You can go back and listen to that. But it's interesting, though, that when it comes to the temple portion, the temple servants, that list of names is exactly the same. It's like there was this incredible attention given to accuracy when it came to that portion, which again just highlights the centrality of worship as a central key to holding all of society together. Anyway, that's, an, that's another sermon one day. For me, the biggest surprise in this list, the way it's structured, is the emphasis on place. I mean, like geography, those town names to me is just amazing. I mean, if you're reading through and you read the list of names by family, then verse 21, when it switches, it just pivots from family lineage, which is normal, to son of Bethlehem. You know, when I was practicing this on, on Thursday, uh, Brett was here, and, and, he, and he just mentioned, yeah, that is weird. That's like saying Brett, son of Johannesburg. Yeah, I mean, that's strange, isn't it? There's no other genealogies that flip like that with this emphasis on place and that list people as sons of a particular place. And I think that in Christianity these days, we tend to underestimate the importance of, of place, a particular place that God has us or place that he wants us. I read this really great article a while ago. I want to quote to you a little, a little piece of it about this. It says, the paradox of place is that while God may exist everywhere, human beings don't. We're made from the dust of the earth and we're forever linked to it and can no more escape its boundaries than we can escape ourselves. In fact, we each owe our existence, at least in some small way, to geography. We cannot trace our heritage without simultaneously tracing the map, the places where our forebears lived and loved forever bound up in the strands of our DNA. So, I mean, as Christians these days, we have immense freedom to live anywhere. And I mean that like from a biblical perspective, to go back like a month ago, when we spoke about breaking down the walls of hostility, I mentioned that our primary identity as Christians is we are citizens of the kingdom of God. 
That's our primary citizenship, our primary national cultural identifier is Christian. And then second are those other cultural identifiers that we use, which is true. But that's not to say that the particular place, culture, people, particular that God has you or that he wants to send you are insignificant to him. I believe he attaches great purpose, not just to us serving him, but serving a particular people rooted in a particular place. See, and you get that from this list because they're all wound together. You cannot separate out of this list people, family, place, worship. Which is why we believe in the local church, don't we? A place of worship in a particular community. And a huge part of my enthusiasm in, in, in coming here and what made that difficult process a little easier is just for me a connection to this place in the city of Joburg. Not because it's the prettiest or easiest place to live, but because God has specific purposes for this place. And I believe he's stirring our hearts to reach this particular place. Now, one of the reasons I'm saying this as well is because, you know, in South Africa, there's, there's a continual background conversation, if not foreground conversation, about emigrating. And, you know, which is, as Christians, we do, we have this freedom to live anywhere. And I know as Christians, if you're considering this, I know that you've prayed about it. We do, we seek God's guidance on this. But my concern is we don't often take into consideration in asking God what place and what people in what particular place can we worship and serve you. Those questions about place and people in a place have to be considered. God has particular designs for us when it comes to place. And you can see this as well in Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to close off this, this point in a second, but just listen carefully to Acts chapter 17, verse 26 to 27. So Paul is kind of on, the, on a sermon here, and he's kind of tracing the story, and he says, And he made, so God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. That they should seek God in that place and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. It's a curious emphasis in this whole story on places. They return back to Jerusalem to rebuild it. And as I draw this to a close, I want to leave one last thought to you that relates place and worship and this idea of a list. So if you think about like what, what list of names do you want to be on? So a lot, a lot of people, okay, Fortune 500 list. Man, I wish I could be on that list. Oh, I remember you know, at school, sitting in school assemblies in these freezing cold you know, halls, and looking up on the walls are all those like boards of people who've won awards of stuff. And I remember like always looking and wondering which of those lists I could get on. You know, so I'd look at soccer and go, man, I'm useless at soccer. Athletics, I cannot run to save my life. You know, netball, no. Uh, you know, like what, just going, what list? Like, what, what could I get on? Like, what honor roll could I get my name on? And I tell you, there's one list of names that you want to make sure you are on. So in Revelation 21, it's a really interesting chapter when it comes to place because it tells the story of God remaking the earth and how we will spend eternity in a place. We won't just be in the clouds, don't believe that. In a place, a place called the New Jerusalem. 
And in this place, as John receives this vision about our eternal place, it says, no, there's no sun because the glory of God just shines so brightly. We can just see there's no temple because God's presence is around us. This beautiful picture of eternity. But then he says this in verse 27 about who will go into that place. But nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's a list of names. You need to make sure that your name is on the Lamb's book of life. And you ask, well, how do I get on to that list? Maybe you're not a Christian watching this. And the simple answer is through faith and trust in Jesus. And we're going to celebrate that in communion in just like two minutes. That's all it is. But let me warn you, if you're considering this, you trusting Jesus as your Savior and you entering into his kingdom, let me tell you, will be the most disruptive event in your life. Because he's going to draw you way out of your comfort zone. And he's going to lead you into difficult places. But places where he has promised to be present and guide you will be the most thrilling journey of your life. But it's this massively disruptive event. And let me tell you this, if you're listening to this, your name, your name is being written. And he is personally, remember that? God is personally reaching out to you, inviting you to join him. Let's pray. God, I thank you this morning. We thank you that you're a God who's not just transcendent and out there governing the universe, but you're also at the same time imminent near to us, that you know us by name. You know, every detail of our lives and the script for our lives has already been written. You know, the number of hairs on our head. You have written particular purpose, good works that you plan before the foundation of the world for us to walk in. You've already written that story for me for all of us by name. It is astounding, God, and we can't comprehend that, but we personally thank you for calling us out of darkness into your kingdom of light, for showing us individually that you love us, that you have particular purpose for us. And God, I pray simply this morning that you would stir up our hearts, that everybody watching the stream, would you be doing a stirring even now to clarify in amidst this great disruption where you are calling us to serve you more deeply in what areas of our lives and maybe for some different places or God, would you stir our hearts to follow you out of comfort into the more difficult places where we get to really walk by faith and experience your power at work in us and around us. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen.